Hello and welcome to a Livewire Markets panel on Australian equities. Today, we're joined by three experts on Australian equities in large cap, small cap, and income investing spaces. We have Dr. Dan Hampson from Plato, we have Marcus Burns from Spiria, and Blake Henricks from Firetrail. So we're gonna be talking in three segments today. The first, we'll look at what matters most, the Australian equity space. Then we'll have a look at three charts that tell an interesting story about the market. And finally, we'll look at where each of our experts are positioning their portfolios. And we'll finish up with six rapid fire questions. So let's launch into segment one, what matters most for Australian equities? So Marcus, we're gonna start with you. Small Caps has had a pretty tough run. What's gonna matter in 2024? It has, a, it has had a very tough run. Um, I think, look, mostly there'll be more of the same. I think earnings, um, valuations, which normally drive small caps will be really important. Um, and obviously to, to your point, you know, small caps have massively underperformed large caps. So there's a big disparity between some of the large names, not all of them, but some of the large cap names. Um, and you know, many sectors and smalls have been really, really debased because of, because of earnings downgrades this year. Okay, and Blake, what are you seeing across the large cap space? Uh, I think as we look into 24, what matters as an active manager is mispricing opportunities. And you know, what I'm seeing is there's a couple of areas of the market that are mispriced where the market's just re not recognising some of the quality of the businesses there, the growth, um, healthcare um, would, be, would be a classic example where I think people have become a bit blase about some of the earnings growth those companies can deliver. And I can see that in the valuation. So you know, we, we just look forward to more mispricing opportunities we're seeing a lot at the moment. And is this the same for dividends? Look, I think uh, the most important stuff for us would be what are commodity prices doing, because that's a key driver for the iron ores, big miners, etc. Um, but broadly, I suppose, it really, it's, it's what is the RBA going to do in interest? Is there only one more tightening? Then that's probably pretty good. I think we'll, uh, we'll uh, get through and uh, the economy will still be strong. But if we you know, have three or four tightenings, then a uh, whole, new, whole new difference for uh, the domestic-focused companies. Okay. Now, Blake, you touched on valuations earlier. What's looking cheap and what's looking expensive? Uh, well, some of the areas that we think are, you know, really attractive would be a healthcare. You know, we see double-digit earnings growth for some of the big stocks like the CSLs, the ResMeds, um, and, that, and that looks really attractive to us. Conversely, you know, one area we think is very expensive is the banks. Um, now, sound like a bit of a broken record, and, and they continue to perform, I think, very well, given their earnings outlook. But to give you an idea, you know, Commonwealth Bank, which is a, a, a fantastic franchise. But it's delivering 13 to 14 percent ROEs now, and trading on 2.4 times book value. Now, if we look at any other financial which you know uses a price to book versus ROE. That is just it's 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 off the charts. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we think the whole banking sector looks very expensive, um, and it's not just CBA. It's, it's to be honest, all of them, given the competitive intensity and the low ROEs that we're seeing. Okay, and what sort of things are you seeing on the small cap side? Yeah, look, it's it's um, there's been a real bifurcation as well as it normally is in a market dislocation. So, any stocks that have had earnings certainty or upgrades have seen a massive re-rating. So, some of the sort of SaaS tech names um, that you know met, met or beat guidance this year got massively re-rated. Um, anything that was cyclical in nature got massively derated. So, you know, the retail space, um, some media names, all media names got really debased, um, and then some of the sort of former tech darlings that lost their luster have been really sold off as well. So, they're the areas we think are probably quite perspective at the moment. Okay, and Don, where are the value plays when it comes to the dividend picks? Um, well, we still think uh, the miners and particularly the oil and gas um, and coal producers look very cheap. Uh, obviously, they're in a bit of a downgrade cycle at the moment because uh, their commodity is coming off, but we still think they look very, very cheap. On the flip side, uh, some of the defensive areas uh, look very expensive and look at you know, Woolworths and, and coals uh, are certainly looking expensive. Maybe Combank's expensive, but it keeps on delivering. So. <laughs> Um, and still a pretty good yield. Okay, now we're often told to tune out the noise. What do you think investors are focusing on too much at the moment? Don, we'll start with you. I think they're focusing too much just on the, on the media. It's like you turn on the TV and it's all about, oh, people can't afford to put food on the table, etc. And yes, there are some people struggling, but the reality is corporate Australia is still doing pretty well. And so I think they're worrying about individuals, but most companies are actually doing pretty well. Yeah, is, and this is a similar thing that you're seeing, Blake, as well? Uh, I mean, it seems that all that anyone cares about is interest rates at the moment, what's the direction. And so, you know, when we go out and talk to companies, you know, we're out on the road a lot. Yes, interest rates matter, particularly if you're very geared, but for most companies, they're, they're focused and we're focused on, you know, what's the competitive dynamic? How are they innovating with new product development? 
how are they maintaining their cost base and, and trying to keep that as low as possible. So, you know, I think it's very easy to get really macro at certain points. But, you know, when we're out there on the coal face, you know, certainly running businesses better is, is where we're focused. Okay. And Marcus, what are you seeing when it comes to small caps? Yeah, look, I think the one, the one area I'd say is, is inflation. Stickiness of inflation being the buzzword. Everyone's, I mean, the headline today in Bloomberg is sticky. I mean, um, it, I, think, I think we're actually making it sticky. So the perceptions of, of it being sticky are actually driving the stickiness. Um, inflation's been Teflon for, for 25 to 30 years, literally between 2 and 3%, and suddenly it has two years where it's up above that, and suddenly it's sticky. Um, so I think that's got everyone worried about, about interest rates, to Blake's point. Um, and I think it's, 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 a, it's a massive hang-up that's actually completely mis, you know, mis, uh, misaligned with, with reality because inflation's decreasing every day at the moment. Okay. So we're going to move on to segment two, A Picture Tells a Thousand Words. And our three experts today have brought three charts that they think tell an important story about the market. So we're going to start with Blake's chart, which shows uh, CSL bearings gross margins from 2018 all the way projected out to 2028. So Blake, tell me about this chart. Yeah, so I mean, CSL is a large company in the Australian stock market. So that's why I brought it along today. It's a, it's a bellwether company. Uh, it's also the largest portfolio position in the high conviction fund today. And, and the reason for that is CSL was a COVID loser. Um, they lost a lot of volume as people stayed at home through COVID, didn't collect as much plasma. And this CSL bearing division is, you know, makes up about 80% of the valuation of CSL. So this is the key chart. And I think when you look at it, what you can see is that those margins have come off a lot after showing fairly stable uh, trajectory, came off through COVID. We don't think there's any reason why they won't bounce back. And on that basis, CSL is going to be delivering double digit earnings growth out to 2028. And you can buy it on a multiple that, that's not obscene. Uh, you know, this stock traded at 40 times a few years ago. You know, today you're buying it on mid 20s PE one year forward. And you, to us, that looks incredibly attractive. Oh, well, there's a good tip. Right, so we're <laughs> going to move on to uh, the second chart, which is from Dr. Don Hampson here. So it's showing uh, the probability of dividend cuts from 2001 all the way to the end of November 2023. What is this telling us, Don? Well, what is, uh, and this is an aggregate um, average of all uh, dividend paying companies looking at the likelihood they'll cut their next dividend. So when we aggregate it up at the market level, as you can see, it's quite a squiggly line, but um, high is bad on this chart and low is good. And there's a long-term average is around 22%. And what it's showing is at the moment that yes, it has risen and it's slightly above average, the risk of dividend cuts at the market level, but it's only very, very slightly above average. So it's nothing like, uh, the previous peaks, which are the GFC and uh, the pandemic uh, three and a half years ago. So it, you know, things are a little tougher than they have been in the last 18 months, but not very much. So it's still pretty good outlook and we still expect some pretty good dividends in the next 12 months. Okay, so some of the fears are a bit overhyped. I think so, yeah. Okay. And Marcus, you've got a chart here that is showing us um, the returns in domestic and global um, equities. Um, so large, smaller micro caps uh, since January 2022. Yep. Um, tell us why this chart is an interesting Well, obviously, one. You know, we're a small cap manager, so we have a, we have a different lens. We look, we look at small caps and, and they have really materially lagged um, large caps, both domestically and internationally. So some of that, I think, is based on um, investors' you know, perception of risk and they've gone back to liquid large cap names for dividends, for, for certainty, etc. Um, there's been a real um, a, you know, massive amount of money coming out of, this, out of the small cap space. Secondly, I think they're more economically um, sensitive. So there have been you know, many cases that are not as diversified as large cap names, so they've seen more hits to, to earnings. Um, but that doesn't mean that they've, they've really underperformed large, um, and particularly micro. So the smaller you get, the bigger the underperformance. Um, and what we found historically is during periods of very aggressive sell-offs like that, when the market does recover, um, I guess the, probably the biggest catalyst there, well, the most obvious catalyst could be interest rates, you know, stabilising or being cut. Then there's a massive recovery in smalls versus large, and we think that we're you know, we're far closer to that, to that sort of bottom in, in smalls and micro as we, than we've been for a very long period of time. Okay, so small caps might be about to have their moment. Well, yeah, the opportunity is there, should we say? Yeah. Okay. All right. So onto our third segment, well, we've looked at what matters in Australian equities. We've had a look at some of the data and some interesting charts here. We're going to turn now to how you're uh, positioning your portfolios for 2024. So, Don, we're going to start with you. How are you positioning your portfolio? Has this dramatically changed in the last 12 months? Not really. Um, we're fully invested and we tend to be always fully invested. And even though we've had 13 interest rate rises and cash rates are 4.35%, that's still less. That's about, that's about the same as the cash yield of the market, but we actively trade to get a lot more than that. 
And the market has also got fracking credits and you don't get any on, on interest. So we're fully invested because we can get better income out of, out of shares. Um, in terms of sectors, we like insurers. So we've, we've positioned overweight insurers. We've pulled back our positions in some of the miners and the uh, and oil and gas sectors given their commodities have come off. But clearly we watch that every day. But largely we're, we're fully invested and uh, still think there's plenty of opportunities for income out there. Okay. So Marcus, we've just said that the time could be looking quite promising for small caps. How are you positioning? Oh, good question. We're, we're, um, we're very um, sort of overweight, some more cyclical names. So stocks have unformed over the last 12, 18 months. We're starting to see uh, earnings base out. And um, I think the other thing is the management teams are getting are adjusting themselves to inflation. So they're actually learning how to raise prices and cut costs for the first time in, in, in say, 20 years. Um, and so, you know, we've got names like Iris in there, um, Link, Bega, um, some names that have, you know, have struggled over the last 12, 18 months, but, but we're starting to see some turnarounds or some management teams get a hold of costs, um, particularly in case of Iris recently. They had an announcement update that you know, basically said we're getting you know, costs now under control um, and they're starting to get some revenue growth back in the business. So I think you know, those, those, those kind of names, see, you know, we see good opportunities. Okay. And Blake, how are you positioning for the next 12 months? Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll stay fully invested, but uh, you know, some of the areas that look attractive to us Healthcare I've mentioned uh, extensively. Uh, energy remains to us to be quite attractive. You know, if you if you look at the backdrop in the last few years, demand has rebounded, right, to well above now pre-COVID highs. We're talking about 102, 103 million barrels a day, and previously the, the previous highs were around 100. So, demand is actually fairly robust. Uh, if you look at the supply side, there hasn't been as much disruption as we probably would have expected post Russia Ukraine. And then also more recently, some of the tensions in the Middle East. But you know, there is a geopolitical premium that sits in oil um, over time. And you know, at, at some of these prices we're seeing today, and what's priced into the equities, uh, the risk reward looks very, very attractive to us in that space. So they're, they're two of the big ones um, where we, we see you know, really good value. OK, oh, excellent. So I'm going to finish up with six rapid fire questions. Um, Don, to start with, where are we most likely to see dividend cuts in 2024? Uh, well, I think consumer discretionary is certainly uh, likely to have some stocks cutting dividends, but it's largely in the price. Um, and because oil prices have come back recently, I think they'll, they'll probably, uh, unless they rebounds, they'll have to cut their dividends as well. But again, that's largely in the price. So I do think they look pretty attractive for valuation. So I'm with Blake on that. Okay. Blake, what is your go-to financial metric when it comes to assessing a company and why? Uh, I'll say return on invested capital. Um, you know, what we want to avoid is companies that are over earning versus what you know the competitive dynamic will typically allow and what happens when you earn a lot of money you typically spend a lot of money and that's when you can see a lot of waste alternatively if, if we can find companies that are earning very low return on capital potentially unsustainably low loss making industries or loss making businesses around them that can actually make a very attractive opportunity so you know i'd use return on invested capital as a, a really key metric i like to look at one of the first things i look at when i'm picking up a new stock Okay. Marcus, which small cap has had the most brutal sell-off in 2023 but remains high quality? Oh, good. That's a good question. I mean, there's, there's, been, there's been so many. Um, <laughs> um, I, look, I, I think I'd probably name Iris again as, as the top one there. I mean, Iris is um, you know, ubiquitous in Australia and UK for both buy and sell side. Um, you know, people probably feel using technology. It's very sticky, a bit like inflation. Um, they've got incredible pricing power. Um, there's a lot of cost in business that can be that can be pulled out of it, and that's what the new the new management team's finding. Um, and the stock has been had a, had a downgrade during results that was fairly modest, uh, I think, in the context of, of its earnings base. But stock had absolutely punished. Um, it has rebounded a bit in the last three or four weeks, um, but still remains heavily oversold. And we think you know very compelling value, great cash flow generator, um, fairly modest gearing, and um, compared to its history, it's not, you know it's not a very very low multiple compared to its long term history. So we think it's a good opportunity still. Okay. Don, which company do you think has underappreciated dividend potential for 2024? We like Ampol. And um, yeah, so we, we, we think Ampol's a great one. It's got a, plenty of frank credits as well. So uh, yeah, we think there's uh, good potential for dividends there. Okay. Blake, Santos and Woodside, deal or no deal? And would you buy it? Uh, we already own Santos. Um, uh, there's, there's no proposal at the moment for me to make a comment on, but, but what I can say is that Santos looks incredibly attractive to us. It's pricing in low $60 a barrel uh, into perpetuity. We think the price will be higher than that in the medium term. 85% of the business is LNG, 
This is a really you know, important transition fuel. The Australian government's actually flipped probably on their view from a year ago, saying now it's important to the transition and uh, you know, some incredibly valuable assets in there. So I don't know which way it's gonna go, but I'm not surprised that people are interested corporately in Santos. Okay, and our final rapid fire question. Marcus, what's the biggest misconception about small caps investing? Why is it wrong? Wow, why small caps? It could be the whole market. I mean, it's, it's, it could be far broader than that. Um, look, I think, um, it's, I think it's the fact that um, uh, people, people look at small caps as being risky, and I think that they see um, it's being driven, very, very driven by momentum. Um, and whilst there's a true short term, I think long term, it's driven by fundamentals. And, um, you know, we see hype constantly building up in various sectors and small caps, lithium a couple of years ago, buy now, pay later a couple of years ago. Um, but long term fundamentals, you know, cash flows, valuations, balance sheets, all the basic stuff comes out to the fore. Um, so we highlighted those two areas, particularly a couple of years ago, as being very overbought. Um, equally, there's some other parts of the market that are very oversold um, correspondingly because people are selling things to, to buy those over overhyped areas. Um, that misconception and those, those extreme valuation anomalies persist in smalls, and that, that creates huge opportunity, we think, if you've, if you've done the work. Okay, yeah. that's a good note to finish on. Thank you very much for sharing your insights today. If you've enjoyed this panel session, please subscribe to Livewire Markets and Market Index. Thank you for watching.